Our next speaker is Professor Sander van der Leeuw. He is Dean of the School of Sustainability and co-chair of the Complex Adaptive System Initiative at Arizona State University and an external professor at Santa Fe Institute. His core research theme is the study of the dynamics of societies and their environments, recently investigating the relationship between innovation and urban dynamics. Uh, in this presentation, Professor Van der Leeuw is going to talk about complex system theory, sustainability, and innovation. He will lead us through two and a half million years of human history to see how societies have evolved with the environments to the point that the later no longer follow their own dynamics due to human impacts. He will end with a discussion of the phenomenon of crisis and argue how the role and scope of innovation needs to be changed in a contemporary society. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Senda Vendelieu. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you can just take that. My Jeffrey's talks are always a very hard act to follow. And I'm going to try, but I will, for one, not walk around as much. I will try and be a little bit more limited in time and see where we end up. Even though it's true, I have to talk about two and a half million years. And the other thing I want to say before I start is that, yes, there is an underlying tenor of complex systems theory in my talk. But because I don't want to define complex systems just as little as Jeffrey did, it's up to you to find that thread in my talk, okay? All right, let's start. So the first uh, point to make is that my starting point is the present. And because I'm in a school of sustainability, it is basically what we now call the Anthropocene. That is a period in which human societies don't only define their environment, its perimeter, its characteristics, its challenges, and the solutions they might find for that, but where they actually have done that to such an extent that they more or less have grabbed control over a large part of the environment. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is how that came about, how that came about at the same time as societies themselves grew and became more encompassing, and also then at the end of my talk about what the implications, or at least some of the implications, of that evolution might be. The apparent results are these, and the last day you will have Will Stefan talk about these illustrations. I don't have to be long about them. They essentially show that over the last two centuries, since about 1790, uh, everything around us, whether it's demographics or uh, phosphorus use or CO2 or what have you, including paper consumption and McDonald's restaurants and everything else that you can't read out there from a distance, has actually exploded on us. And then on the other hand, I want to point out that clearly, as a person involved in sustainability, I have to deal with some of the limits of that and some of the difficulties that that has actually caused for our environment. But I don't see, as my first slide saw, said, I don't see this as an env environmental problem. I see this as a societal problem. Humans are part of a complex adaptive systems, and for this audience, I don't have to go into much detail about that. But I want to basically emphasize the high dimensionality of those systems because they are in sharp contrast for a long time of human history with the limited dimensionality of what humans could actually perceive of those systems. Moreover, such systems have multiple attractors, as you all know. They have tipping points and unstable phases, and there is no long-term predictability. So the question for our species is, how have we dealt with that, and how has that dealing varied through time. Now, now, many people distinguish human beings from most of the animal world by saying that humans learn, or even that they learn how to learn. 
And yes, they do that. But I want to go a little step further and basically argue that humans do more than that. They can experiment, they can abstract, they can symbol, they can accumulate learning, and they can organize themselves and their social and natural environments. And I would argue that the underlying tenor of what I'm going to be talking about today is that all and everything humans do is to organize. And that we therefore should change perspective from a population perspective to an organization perspective in trying to look at what human evolution is actually all about. I would also argue that every society is an information society. Information society is a modern world that came about as part of the computer revolution, communication revolution, and so on and so forth. And I have made it very clear point in all my discussions in Europe and elsewhere to argue that every society from the smallest, including your own family, is effectively an information society. And why is that the case? Because information is the only thing that is not subject to the conservation principle. What I say to my students, I throw them a piece of chalk when there was still chalk in the classroom, but that's another story. Um, and I then explain that now they have it and I don't have it anymore. So matter cannot be shared in that sense. Energy cannot be shared in that sense. Information can be shared. And it is therefore information that is the knowledge about things, the knowledge about how to do things, the codified knowledge in institutions and things like that, that actually keeps a society together. People, as individuals, though, need energy. So when Jeffrey talks about the interaction between information networks and energy networks, it is about, on the one hand, the need to create also outside us energy and resource networks, and at the same time maintain information networks. And so a lot of what the long-term evolution of society is all about is the interaction between those two kinds of networks. The energy networks are clearly, in many cases, dendritic. The information networks are not dendritic. And I'm not going into that interaction in itself, because my emphasis here is about the long-term history and how we came to be with our environment what we are right now. But I would argue that societies are held together by the information they process and the meanings that they attach to that, the culture that they build around that, and that energy is an enabler, but at the same time a constraint. And I will get back to that as I move through various episodes of human history. Now you've seen in my first second slide this great acceleration of human organization and its positive and negative consequences, including waste, CO2, and so on. If you look at this from an archaeological perspective, and that is what I originally am, then the quest there are three questions that come out. On the one hand, why did that hockey stick curve take so long? Why did it take two and a half million years, more or less, before we suddenly saw that acceleration? And once we saw it, why did it go so fast once it got going? And then finally, of course, and that is the real nub of this whole story, what is it? And I would argue that it is not climate nor environment, but effectively the innovative capacity of society. And so what I need to ask first is what is different about humans that they can develop complex technologies? And then are the enabling factors biological, sociocultural, or maybe both? Or at some stages one and at some stages another? Now let's look over this very long-term time. And I'm here only looking on this graph at the last 450,000 years. But this pattern that you see here stretches much longer. And we could argue that until about 10,000 years ago, there has been an incredible variability, very dramatic variability in climate, in environment on Earth. Yet, what we find is that over most of that period, until let's say about 50,000 years ago, 
Culture change was absolutely minimal. People walked around in small groups all over the earth, and we have lots of data about that, but it is more or less the same mode of life for that whole long period. And so we need to ask why that might be so. And my point here is that all of this has to do with our short-term working memory. We have a capacity as modern humans, experimentally documented, to deal with, let's say, seven plus or minus two dimensions at the same time. That doesn't mean we can't have more in our memory, but when we do an action or have to conceptualize a process, we have a limit to the dimensionality that we can actually deal with. And that is very much what the first part of my story is all about. We can follow in different ways how that short-term working memory has evolved over the last roughly two million years. And our starting point is primates, as always. And what we know is that chimpanzees are generally able to have three things in mind at the same time when they crack nuts. And they have, at that point, an anvil. They put a nut on it, and they have a hammer to beat it. And that is about as much as they can do. And actually, it turns out, about a quarter of chimpanzees are not even able to do that. So they have a lesser dimensionality that they can handle in an effective way. There's all kinds of tests, and I'm not going to, in, going to go into those. We have actually, together with a, a colleague from UCLA, Dwight Reed, we have published about this, and I'm going to leave it at that. On the other hand, as I said, our modern humans deal with about seven plus or minus two. Now, two of the kinds of evidence that we have for how that evolution were, went are the following two. We can basically say that chimpanzees reach adolescence at the age of three or four years. Humans reach adolescence at the age of, let's say, 14. If you extrapolate from one to the other, you actually get a line that ties the two together and that makes an indirect, and certainly not a proof, but an indirect argument that indeed, if we have a longer or a later adolescence, we as humans have a chance to develop a brain that can handle more short-term working memory dimensions. Another way to look at that is to plot various species of hominins, that is, early humans before modern humans, against the proportion between brain size and body size. And that is what has happened here. And the vertical sort of fuzzy columns, and fuzzy because clearly we don't have exact dates about all of this, uh, indicate sort of when various stages of this encephalization quotient that you see on the left-hand side, and thereby the short-term working memory that we associate with it on the right-hand side, occur. But that is only con also, to some extent, conjecture. It's indirect. We do have a very interesting way to follow this on the actual prehistoric evidence and to follow the individual stages of that development on the basis of how prehistoric populations actually made their artifacts, their stone tools. And so what I'm going to argue here, and I will show this in a, in a sort of table in a moment to sort of compress the evidence, is how over the two million odd years, we actually devised ways to do much and more and more complex things with these pieces of stone in preparing them to be our tools. The very first of those, let's say the older one choppers, have initially just one point where a flake was hit off, so they have a specific point that has been artificially sharpened. You can imagine, because that's a point that is dimension zero. And I am going to illustrate the rest of this story based on that and then show you the table. What we then see is that you get a number of chips that are chipped off in a line. So you suddenly get a one-dimensional situation that is conceptualized. 
The next stage is when people make that line around, and then they have an option. Either they take a, a big flake and then sharpen the edge, or they sharpen the edge first and then take off the big flake. By that point, because you can do both, people must have made choices that involve a second dimension, that is, a surface as well as a line. And you can follow that also in the third dimension. At a certain point, what you see is that people prepare one layer, two layers, two sides of a piece of stone, and then start working it on the third side. What I'm arguing with this, and this is only a small part of a much more complex and longer story that is summarized in this graph, is that actually, although we always dealt with three-dimensional objects, we conceptualize them as such only after a lot of experiment, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of actually development of that short-term working memory. Now, what I've done here, and this is again a, a table that is difficult to read, but in the first column is the sort of conceptual stage, that is, the number of dimensions that are handleable. And then in the third column are actions. In the fourth column are what is new about each of those actions. And then when you go to the red column at the end uh, towards the right, you actually see how those relate to the short-term working memory stages of human biological development. And then in the next column, you actually see the years, the age of the artifacts that we have that demonstrate these particular cognitive procedures that we have acquired as human beings, and then the last column, where we actually found them and what kind of artifacts they are. All of that, the details of that, we can discuss. They are not fundamental to my argument. All I'm saying is that it did take till about 50,000 years ago for us to develop a short-term working memory that could deal with seven plus or minus two dimensions. This shows you some of the results Top left are the very first choppers that we have. Bottom right are some of the very polished, very well-conceived objects where we have been able to use also multi-scalar approaches. Take off big pieces first, take off smaller pieces later. And you can see how little by little humans actually get control over shape. And that is an important part of why they develop these tools. Now, what kind of life went with that? And I want to emphasize two parts of that. On the one hand, that for much of that period, people harvested things from the environment. They did not intervene in the environment. They were basically reactive to what they found around themselves. They had a multi-resource strategy. They adapted to change by moving around. If you couldn't find your berries here anymore, you tried and find, found them somewhere else. And generally, they stayed below the environment's carrying capacity. One of the interesting data we have from Australia is that we can now, on the basis of the bones, actually notice when people underwent famine. And we see in Australia that people in the inland, where there was very little to eat, never had a famine. The only people who had famines were people in the rich environments. Because there it all seemed like everything would be fine forever. And then ultimately, the system crashed. And a lot of these people had three or four famines in their lifetime, which is much shorter than an actual lifetime. So that mode of life, staying below the carrying capacity of the environment, always thinking about how can we use as little energy as possible, and doing this by moving around and so on and so forth is the pattern that we have until about 50, maybe 35,000 years ago. You know, in my profession, a thousand years is nothing, at least not when I talk about these things. And so forgive me if I sort of am not totally precise about that. Moreover, that changes almost by year with new excavations, new dating techniques, and so on and so forth. So what I'm actually concluding from this is that people lack the know-how to interact with their environment. That change and risk were at the order of the day and they were simply accepted as such because they couldn't do anything about it anyway. In some ways, people minimize change. 
for example, in an area like Epirus, which is very uh, subject to earthquakes, they would actually settle in the areas where the earthquakes occurred. Because that meant that regularly, the earthquake would reset the environment to zero, and they could maintain the same way of life. The next stage of all of this, this is the first long stage, is when, let's say 50,000, 35,000, that short-term working memory of seven plus min or minus two has been arrived at. From that moment, we don't see any changes till the present. Maybe for the future, that's another story, but not up to now. And nevertheless, from that moment on, we see a huge explosion in innovations. And so what I sort of concluded from that is that we have, have arrived at a time where there is no longer a biological constraint to create new tools for thought, but that there is a cultural constraint, that it takes time, it takes experimentation, it takes all kinds of ways of living to come up with new manipulations, mental manipulations, to actually deal with various developments. So, then the question is, are there from that moment on other constraints? And then that second question that I asked at the beginning, what are the consequences of that acceleration? So let's look very briefly at the kinds of operations, mental tools, not artifacts, that are available at around 35,000. For one, and this must have been available for a much longer time, there is a distinction possible between reality and conception. We, humans, by that point, can categorize. That is, they can simultaneously work on differences and similarities. They can have, in their minds, feedback mechanisms, feed-forward mechanisms, and reversibility. That is, they can go from a result to a cause and then start with the cause and implement the result. So there are memory and control loops. There is a mental generation of events that can be inserted in operations. There are choices. And the choices are fundamental because they allow to substitute one action for another action. They can deal with all kinds of hierarchies, point line surface volume, but also size hierarchies, hierarchies of control loops. They're able to actually distinguish between a whole and its parts and go from the parts to the whole and from the whole to the parts. That's what I mean under partonomy. And they can have sequenc sequences and they can begin to anticipate at the very early stages of making a particular artifact, they already have in mind what is necessary at the end stage of making that artifact, so they anticipate on those kinds of necessities. These are some of the tools that then come up. What you can see is that they're much smaller, they're much finer, they have total control over the shape, in particular these Neolithic axes, because they move from taking big flakes off to smaller and smaller and smaller ones up to the point that they actually, uh, how do you say, um, they rub the surface to get a complete control over the surface. But what they also do is they go the other way around. Rather than only take off from a, an object, they actually compose objects, the composite tools, but also the fish trap and the basketry, which essentially are taking something that is linear and making it in a two-dimensional and potentially a three-dimensional object. So around 10,000 years after this very critical transition phase, we see these kinds of things emerging. And the one that I think is re the one that is really important here is the new topologies. Suddenly, we don't only take off from a solid to create a smaller solid or multiple solids, we actually create solids around voids. We begin to be able to create houses, baskets, pots, and so we separate the concepts of surface and volume. And we get a tangled hierarchy of concepts. A surface that defines a volume is defined by another volume. So all these kinds of operations are then suddenly possible. Now let's look at the next stage, the third stage. And this is the Neolithic. This is the Holocene. And what you see on this graph, and this graph reads from right to left, I have to point out, is that the climate and the natural environment stabilizes. Now that is exactly the time 
when social evolution takes off. And very many, many things happen in a very short time. So again, we have this, asked this question, why is that contrary? There is no environmental driver clearly here. There must be another driver. And so what we then get is initially a very fundamentally different way of life, the village way of life. Now, however many people there are in those villages, and that is difficult, some people make a village into a city and vice versa and so on. I think what the important things here is, the important thing here is that people start investing in their environment. So they actually have a stake in their environment. So they move around a lot less because they spend a lot of effort creating a particular environment. So suddenly there is an interaction between society and its environment. We see a change in subsistence base. Cultivation and herding take over. There again, we have a long time perspective because we clear out the land, we seed, we wait till it grows up, and with herding, we actually wait even longer till we have a good herd. We have new technologies. We have a different social life, and that becomes more and more important because this is the beginning of the moment that social life and relying on each other and social problems actually emerge as a new set of problems that replace a lot of the environmental problems that were in existence until then. So we get a different perception of space and time, again, because we have invested in it and we are no longer mobile. So from harvesting the environment, we move to investing in the environment. We no longer meet challenges by mobility, by simply finding it somewhere else. But the interesting thing here, of course, is that that old system could have continued. Why didn't it? And I would argue that that is the evolution of our conceptual toolkit during the Pleistocene that actually made that change. And then for me, the question becomes, is the climate the driver or is the climate the enabler? These are just a couple of slides to show you the kinds of things. Up left, we have sort of a village, a, a Neolithic village. Up right, a reconstruction of a prehistoric plow, something like Stonehenge. And then, very interestingly, a Neolithic statue. That actually represents, in three dimensions, a three-dimensional phenomenon. If you go back 20,000 years ago, you have cave art, where people have taken three-dimensional objects and represented them in two dimensions. A very interesting contrast just, just there. So how did all of this change the actual dynamics of the situation? We get a reciprocal relationship to the environment and to climate. Um, let me sort of get this out of the way so I can see time. OK. So sedentary societies try to control the environmental risk. The system becomes more vulnerable to disturbances because it becomes more closely integrated. And the emphasis shifts from being reactive to problem solving. And that itself, because the system in which humans live is a highly dimensional one, brings people together to together solve those problems. Because an individual with the limitations of the short-term working memory cannot really do that. So the cost of all of that is growing societal and social complexity. The next stage is yet another complete revolution which I have referred to, and it is that we begin to bootstrap a process between problem solving, creating the knowledge that comes from that, needing to increase the information processing capacity, which then allows us to cognize new problems, creates new knowledge, and so on and so forth. So we get a feedback loop that actually simultaneously increases the dimensionality with which a society can operate, the number of people that are involved in the society, and at the same time, the kinds of knowledge that is acquired. And so we see a number of major social transformations happening as a result of that. Now let's talk for a moment, and the specialists about urban systems are also here, so I will do this only very loosely. I would argue that urbanization, although it needs a lot of energy, is actually very costly in energy terms. And the need for better problem solving is the driver for urbanization because it brings more and more people in direct contact. So what I actually see happening is that you get an urban way of life 
where people innovate more and more because they're closer together. So it is easier to do that. And in order to maintain that system, they send out from each city tentacles in the surrounding countryside that organize that countryside and the population around it. So what we ultimately have is a dynamic structure in which there is an outbound flow of organization and an inbound flow of energy to make all these people survive. And in order to maintain that system, the innovation becomes the absolutely essential part. And as soon as the information levels out, you can no longer make that system grow. And if you have that for too long, it actually dissipates. So a couple of images of cities and some of the things that go with it. Cities emerge always in networks. They are never single. And there is an explanation for that, but I won't go into that. What we see is counting. The second image at the top is a counting tablet from the pre-writing period. Writing. Write is the Hammurabi's column, which is the first law document that we have. And then down below, you can see an Egyptian clerk. So we also see the emergence of administration. Now, next stage, and I'm again jumping, I don't know how many, probably three or four millennia here, is to the imperial situation. Energy is ever more of a constraint the more people you actually bring together. So ultimately, in order to be able to do that in a city like Rome or Beijing or any other large city, you actually need to bring these tentacles out to cross societies, languages, cultures, because you need all those resources from a wider and wider footprint. So the only way you can kick that off, because it demands organization, and that is a very good example in the Roman case, if there is around the dominant city or the, the empire that does that, some collected energy so that the empire is not dependent on solar energy alone, but can use collected energy to actually create the administration to hold all of that together. So the Roman Empire, as an example, grew on the back of centuries of what I would call leaked organization from the Greek world out into Europe and North Africa, and that enabled the empire to come together. So what you see at that particular point is a shift. We no longer deal with the power to do things, but we begin to see control. We see power over other people. That means we need formal institutions, like the military, the legal people. We need different roles. And we move slowly from conflict resolution to resource and people management. That is symbolized in the material world, for example, by roads and communication. Now, what I would argue is that an empire like that, but also a city earlier on, is actually a flow structure. Energy and matter are gathered to meet human needs, and that organizes the environment, so it dissipates chaos. Societies are such flow structures that exchange information for resources. And the channels emerge through the recursive interaction between people. That is, people need to be aligned. People need to want to do things that are compatible. Otherwise, you can never bring a structure like that. And that is an essential element of the information networks that underlie all of this. Um, OK, this shows the growth of the Roman Empire and all the roads that maintained it. And then I'm going to shift to here and look at the collapse for a moment. From about 250, that core can no longer be innovative enough. There is no longer the use of resources that have been gathered before. So the organization becomes too costly in terms of resources. And we see that because coinage devalues, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So ultimately, the spatial gradient, the value gradient, which is actually that the farther you are from the center, the rarer things are, so the more value they have. And the opposite gradient, the innovation gradient, which says that in the center there is more innovation, they actually level out. And by that point, people lose the interest in being part of the organization. So they actually go their own way. And you see, three centuries later, the breakdown of the Roman Empire. This is the curve of the devaluation of coinage that you actually see. So what I conclude from all of this is that there is not a collapse in population terms, but in organization terms. That armies lose control at the edges, that there are incursions coming. That per annual productivity is too low to carry the overheads. 
and that therefore it is no longer attractive. Now, in the next four slides, and I have to go through these very, very fast to sort of stay within my uh, time, uh, there, I have done a similar study, which I published on the trajectory of Europe in particular, between about 1,000 and 1,800. And the, di the measures that I've used here are relative population increases and demographics, the total surface of individual political units, the extent of trade, the density and extent of transport and communication systems, roads and things like that, the wealth gradient as a proxy of innovation and value gradients, and innovativeness. Now I'm going to go again very fast. From 700 to about 1,000, all of the organization that you saw in Rome disappears. So very high entropy, very low alignedness, very limited extent of the flow structures, only villages or even smaller than that. From about 1,000 to 1,200, you begin to see competition between these local units. And after, little by little, they create a hierarchy, a feudal hierarchy, and that begins to actually create a larger system that is more or less integrated. You get other kinds of cities. You get the Renaissance, when suddenly these links between the North and the South work after the Black Death with large population shifts, increased urban aggregation and wealth, and so on and so forth. The next two centuries are when we go and explore very wide. It's the beginning of the colonial era, but essentially only trade colonies rather than agricultural colonies. So we see a very large independent uh, city power and urban immigration. And then finally, from 1600 to 1800, the lords that want to have the political power and the cities that have the economic power merge and create the kind of merged heterarchical, hierarchical systems that process the information for such large numbers of population most effectively. And then in 1800, the system might just have collapsed. We begin to see the French Revolution, all kinds of revolutions in various parts of Europe. But then what we suddenly see is the discovery of fossil energy. And that gives our society a new lease of life. What you see on the left-hand side is the fact that primitive man uses about 100 watts to stay alive. Our technological man, particularly in the United States, uses about 10,000. And most of that goes into infrastructure. But the f invention of fossil energy suddenly liberates innovation in every which way. And so what we actually are living now is a system in which innovation has become endemic and has become supply-driven. When a company invents something, they stuff it down our throats, and we sort of swallow it, more or less. Before that period, it wasn't like that. An invention could be done somewhere, and only if there was a real need would people pick it up. So what I would argue is that right now, in our society, we are so much dependent on creating innovation in order to continue creating value and attracting people into our system, that this is our biggest weakness. What is the underlying pattern? And I'm going to jump a little bit over the, some of the slides. I think fundamentally it is a perceptual cycle. If you take some of the work of Kahneman and people in the Stanford group that have looked at this, you come to the conclusion that there is a difference in the perception of the relationship between people and their environment, depending on whether you take that from the perspective of the environment and then look at the people in it, or you take it from the perspective of the people in it and look out to the environment. And I have summarized that here. And basically, the net effect of those two together is that we systematically hide for ourselves our impact and the dangers of our impact on the environment, and we augment our sense that it actually helps to do that intervention. And so I would essentially argue that these two perspectives exaggerate natural, natural dangers and undervalue the dangers of human intervention. In reality, society therefore re reduces by its actions the predictability of the natural phenomena or also all kinds of social phenomena. So when we think that we know more, we actually know less because proportionately, the increase in unintended consequences is actually exponential whereas our knowledge increase may be geometric or even linear. So that 
creates crises, because it creates moments at which we cannot in any way see anymore the many aspects of what we have created. So there are some aspects of this. One of them is that landscapes get transformed from things that are natural to things that we need to control for them to stay in more or less the same shape. We shift our uh, risk spectra from narrow, well-known areas to very wide ranges of temporalities, and that is how we generate century or even millennial events ourselves by not being able to handle that whole process. And that is where I come to these unintended consequences. Now I'm going to end without going through all the slides that I have here by the following. I got into all of this because in sustainability, we have a problem. Everybody asks and says politically that we have to invent our way out of trouble. But what we forget is that it's actually invention for two centuries in every which way that got us into trouble. And so what we need to change is our attitude to that. We need to change in the sense that we need to be much more careful about where we focus our inventions. We need to be much more careful at trying to find out what the unintended consequences of our inventions could be before we actually implement them. And that demands a complete different change of also how we work in science and how we work in society, because we need to start learning for the future rather than learning from the past. That demands a different kind of education, a stimulation of creativity in schools, systematically thinking in dynamics, systematically thinking in alternatives, trying to evaluate alternatives by what they actually cause in the sense of trying to see if we make a certain decision, what actually happens, but then also look at the other options that would have been open and what that could have caused. So there is a whole new set of things necessary, and that is where, for me, complex system science actually comes in, because it has begun doing that. It's a long road, which will take us a long time, but which, for me, is an absolutely fundamental road to start walking down. And I think I'll leave it at that, just to stay within time. Uh, my chair was quite worried about that. I think I've done all right, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Vandalius, for the interesting presentation. So now I think we have plenty of time to take questions. If there are any. If not, you have a long lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. Oh, hold on. Somebody is putting the microphone somewhere else. Hello. Uh, uh, my name is Suman Banerjee, and thank you for inviting me about my great grandfathers and their activities. <laughs> but I have a question. You know, I'm 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 a finance researcher, and we believe that you know what has happened is the best to happen, and. Obviously, what you said is there are four, say, four A, B, C, D path. We are in path A. We should have been in path B, and we would have been in a much better situation than A. And that's your guess based on the knowledge that you have acquired through path A, and you're actually using that knowledge to think what would have path B be had we been in path B. But again, we are contingent on the knowledge that we have acquired through path A. Do you follow what I'm saying? So predicting these things, there are many possibilities always. And predicting this condition on the knowledge that we have acquired is actually a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a conditional prediction mm. and might be completely wrong had we started in path B. You're right. And I will try and elaborate a little bit on that last remark about learning for the future. I think what has happened is that two, three, maybe four centuries of very good science have systematically, because they wanted to prove things, looked at things as they had come about. That is, they used a feedback loop between the present and the past. We still need that, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't. 
What I am saying is that we now should also create a more systematic feedback loop and focus our collective energies and intelligence about extending that feedback loop and creating one between past, present, and future. And so in that sense, move indeed after knowing A and B to C. One of the reasons that I think this is important in the financial area is the fact that most financial models, and this was admitted when the crisis hit by the top people in the field, are actually equilibrium models. And I think one of the really important developments that we need to create is to crack the problem of multi-equilibria models in which we can actually move from one system to the next. There was somebody else there. Yeah, please. No. Yeah. No, now you switch it off. Yeah. No. <laughs> Keep on going. Uh, my question is basically: uh, Has the rise of sort of free time, uh, and then the subsequent uh, invention of a tool like the internet to connect people, uh, to sort of use their free time collectively to do things, is that a new paradigm? Whereas before we were you know, in innovating basically to survive, and now we can innovate because we like to? I'm, I'm not sure it's quite like that. I do believe that in many different phases of human evolution, people have invented new networking tools. And I could go on about the invention of language, but I also mentioned writing and other things like that. So in that sense, from the perspective of this being an information society, I don't see this as something fundamentally new. But it is something that we don't know how it is going to structure our society. And that is what is the real question at that particular point. And I don't think we'll find that out for several decades yet, how we can actually use these tools the most effectively. Mm -hmm. But to my mind, the whole idea about uh, demand-driven invention becoming supply-driven invention has to do with the organization of the big corporations and the need to keep creating value in our society in order to keep the society together. And so a colleague of mine that some of the people here in the room know calls these the biggest Ponzi scheme. Because you have to keep going at it. If you can't keep going at it, then you basically are seeing a society that is going to dissipate. Uh, in one of your early slides, you said about the uh, information society. Now, it's no doubt that information and connectivity is forever in the, in the increase. Yeah. And information overload is a term that we also hear of. Is there a limit to it? Is it going to be a problem? I guess it's not a problem yet, but could I, it be a problem? I think there have in the past been limits, depending on the actual means of communication available moments when noise overcame signal. And I would argue that, for example, as you grow a group, you need so many more communications to keep that group aligned that you need to find ways to actually create other channels or more, more efficient channels that are actually able to handle that evolution. The example that I would give is that I, I would personally argue that language has worked that way. That as the societies have become larger and more complex, language has had to define concepts more narrowly and more precisely to avoid the kinds of conflicts that would come about through fuzziness. And so I would argue that when you look at an etymology of a language and you map that through time, you actually see a huge growth in the number of categories that split off from original concepts. Just like in technology, once you have an electric signal that can carry a message, you end up with televisions, mobile phones, and everything else. So I do believe that there are indeed constraints, but that every time society has tried to find ways to overcome those constraints, and I would argue that 
the web and all of that is another one of those examples. I've been in both. I actually spent a year in Michigan. I spent some time in Toronto, so I agree with you. <laughs> so, uh, without huge inputs of resources, these places just cannot keep going, right? And the, if you look at the roads in these places, you look at the housing structures, it's very clear that these places are not built to last, and that they cannot last very long, right? Uh, you look at what else is going on in Michigan outside of Ann Arbor, it's even clearer how quickly things decay when the upkeep costs are not being paid. That's right? Right. It's a matter of half a decade yeah. for complete collapse. So if we take this, your ideas here, to the extreme, uh, the carrying capacity of the Earth, only populating places which are actually habitable and sustainable is probably less than a billion people. Yeah. The path from now to there, unfortunately, looks very bad and very bleak. So looking at that, you know, uh, so what should the message be for actually like, you know, policy people or technology change and say, how do we get the population down to a billion people without just initiating collapse? Okay. Clearly the transition is the real problem that we're facing. It is not the outcome. We know what the outcome needs to be. But the reduction in the demography, although I personally believe that it's a very important element, is not necessarily the only solution. If we can find other kinds of resources that we haven't tapped yet, or if we can do away with very large networks, in particular energy networks, because we can actually localize energy acquisition, there are other ways around that. And I would argue that, again, the transition is the real nub of the thing, because what it demands is that we leave our path dependency and that we change our mindsets fundamentally in thinking about this in a different way. But I just want to make the extra point that indeed finding a completely different resource, of course, would also be a help. And that is part of what uh, wind energy and so on are all about. And I'm not going into that argument, which I think is a very difficult one. But I think you understand what I mean. Please. I agree with the kind of transition that you're talking about. Um, and I also agree with the rather bleak future that is being talked to as to how difficult it is going to be to bring that transition about. If you could take a set of the world's future business and government leaders and put them in a place for a year and educate them, what would you educate them with? Right. Well, let me begin by a remark that I once made to a whole series of uh, people in government-related offices in DC. And I basically said the first thing that America has to do in order to get to deal with this dilemma is change the American dream. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that. And of course, it's a very difficult thing, but it's actually going on right now in, in some ways. If you compare the US to Europe, what you see is that Europe for centuries now has been so densely populated and so in need of resources that arbitration rules trying to set norms and limits for people in society is much more acceptable there than it is where I live now in uh, Arizona, which I think personally has a mentality of people all wanting to be individuals maybe ride a horse, maybe shoot a gun in the air, things like that. But it's a very different image of what social life is actually all about. And so I would argue that seriously thinking about the kinds of mindsets that we need to develop to get to through that transition is the first task. Now, of course, the real difficulty with that is that those mindsets are different in every different culture. And so globalization is a, a very two-edged sword in this whole set of interactions. And one part that I announced in my, my abstract, in which I didn't get to, is actually to study the process of globalization in detail, which I've done at some point in, in, in Europe. Uh, 
and to actually show how information flows actually can change mindsets. But of course, we live in a society where nobody controls information flows anymore. And we see it as part of our norms and, and, and institutions that that should not happen. I'm not saying that it's necessarily always a good thing, but I am saying that by allowing every idea to be everywhere, it becomes very difficult for individuals to distinguish between signal and noise. Yeah, yeah so it, is there a microphone here, over there? Because you guys may not need the microphone, I need you to have the microphone, okay? That's my real problem. Thank you. Uh, this may not be a relevant topic for uh, your talk, but I was wondering, do you think nuclear energy supports our sustainability? Look, uh, that's a debate that I get into a lot. Um, I do agree that right now, economically speaking, as long as we hold to our current economic system, we don't have only any alternative. That doesn't belittle the fact, and I was actually quite close to Three Mile Island when that happened, and I have some idea, at least, of the kinds of dangers, and we, last week, we had a conference in Arizona where the Japanese sort of told us a lot more about Fukushima. Look, these are extremely dangerous sorts of things. If we can keep them safe, I lived for 10 years in France and they have, I don't know how many reactors in France and so far there hasn't been an accident, we may have to live through that phase. I do believe that there are major risks, but then there is major risks also in flying uh, a th uh, one of these Airbuses. And I actually learned today or yesterday in the newspaper that Boeing is now finding similar problems with some of its uh, fibers that it's been using for the hull of the airplane. So we need to experiment with those kinds of things. We need to be as precautionary as we possibly can. But for the moment, I don't see any other source that can immediately absorb the kind of energy that in many countries nuclear creates. I live in a town, by the way, that has the largest nuclear reactor of all the United States next to it. Yeah, behind you there. I understand that uh, one of the fundamental things you saying is that we need systemic thinking. Yeah. Um, now, when you talk about systemic thinking, uh, the question that arises is that given our political structures, given the way we organize today, uh, specific economies uh, around the globe, um, are those structures compatible with having uh, doing this kind of fundamental systemic thinking? Well, you guys all ask the easy questions, don't you? <laughs> Anyway, I'll give you again just a totally sort of a personal opinion. I think every society has the structure it wants and that it has created. I do believe that ultimately, if we start seriously thinking about these issues, we will also change parts at least of that structure. One of the questions that I think is a difference between the US and Europe that I referred to earlier is the extent to which you maximize or where you optimize. If you keep maximizing, ultimately, you get more dangers, you get more risks. If you actually do a bit less of that and don't try and make it all go completely, completely over the top, you may end up with a somewhat sort of easier structure. Now, I'm not saying that that is easier. It's clearly that we have for so long been path dependent in a particular direction that, as I don't know, one of the early astronomers said, yeah, you can get the Earth out of its orbit, but you need a fixed point to leverage against it. And we don't have that <laughs> in our societies. And I think that is one of the biggest problems that we actually encounter. We have to create that fixed point against which we can leverage. And so that then gets me at least to think about, well, ethics, norms, what kind of society do we actually want? We define sustainability in many ways as something that we don't want or certain things that we want to keep and that we don't want to lose and others that we don't want to have anymore. But we have never seriously thought about how all of that fits together. We have never seriously thought systemically 
about that future. And so for me, it's not only a question of systems thinking, it is also a question of ex-ante systemic thinking rather than ex-post systemic thinking, which is what we've done in a, to a large extent. All right. Okay, sure. As long as you have time, I, I, you have to follow that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, basically, from your talk, I have this impression it's like at the beginning, people are not really living together, then they have some problem. They live together to solve this problem, then, uh, which generates new problems. So they need even more people to solve uh, these new problems, and uh, even the city becomes even bigger and bigger. And uh, until we reach the point that the two big cities itself become a problem. So now it's the time to change the mindset. So, uh, I largely agree to that, but I have a question in mind. It's like, OK, when we are thinking about the future, we human beings, just like <clears throat> we don't really think for society. Uh, I mean, OK, this conference may be a bit special. No, no, but the, this Usually is, we this think is a for right. individual, like mm -hmm. uh, all the living creature, mm -hmm. we try to pass on our genes and so on. Mm -hmm. So for the individual, maxim, uh, maximize something is probably the same thing as them optimize. Then for the society, it's uh, mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you foresee the there is possibility a whole, of that? There is a huge you know, literature this about this particular problem. And it is called the common pool resource problem. And it was launched, I think, in the 50s or early 60s, when people start noticing that the collective good is very often not the same as the individual good. And I think that is what you're referring to. And I agree that that is a fundamental problem. On the other hand, if you look at it from the sort of long-term archaeological perspective that I do, I would argue that early societies, and even now in the modern world, societies that have been isolated for a long time, are actually much more attuned to thinking about each other and about the common good than we are in our societies. And I'll give you a, a real-life example of my own life. I spent some time, because my wife was doing research there, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. And so I was with tribes there. And one of the things that strikes you immensely is how these people in everyday life pay attention to all the people around them. And I'll give you an example. We had just arrived there for three or four days when a, an airplane, a little airplane, landed and brought a French anthropologist who wanted to do some research there. And this man probably weighed about 150 or 170 kilos. So in this very accidented terrain, he had a lot of trouble up and down the mountains. Every time that one of the Papuas heard his breath go too fast, they would stop. And they would point out something in the landscape, simply to give this man time to catch his breath again. That's the kind of thing that we don't do very often anymore, in which I think it's helpful if societies think like that. And that goes back to the sort of early societies that I'm talking about. If you live in a group for a long time with 25, 35 people, you know everybody inside out. You have many channels of communication, eye contact, body language, what have you. All of those have become impoverished, and we have replaced them by electronic means or other means that actually have a narrower bandwidth of signal communication between individuals. And I think that is part of the fragmentation that we see in our society. Uh, yeah? Yeah, actually, there's another question. Uh, OK. Uh, it has been in my mind for quite a while. It's like uh, we have been talking about uh, sustainability, uh, but basically from uh, um, I'm working in the networking area. so. Uh, from a network point of view, we know yeah. how to measure the robustness. We know how to yeah. measure the fault tolerance. But how to measure this uh, uh, sustainability? I mean, uh, is yeah. it like the system will basically keep largely unchanged for a long time, then that's sustainable? It's like it can be, mm -hmm. I don't know, in whichever way, uh, keep from, uh, you know, be separated into small pieces or so on. I, all the way, I'm uh, wondering, what's the definition of sustainability? Uh, you're right. And sustainability is clearly what everybody makes for it. But one of the areas there is that you make to have to make the decisions of what you want against what you don't want. But I want to get to what you're saying in a slightly different way. 
there is a beginning area of research that looks at early warning signs of tipping points in societal, biological, and other systems. This is completely new. It's not something that we know a lot about yet. But it's another one of those domains that as part of this whole complex systems change in our perspective, we can and must start exploring. Because that is the kind of thing that we're going to need to better understand this phenomenon. And I'm not saying that that necessarily has to be done from a network perspective, although probably a network perspective is also useful there. But I think there are other ones as well. Yeah, all the way out there. Out, out there. Uh, well, it's all right. Yeah. Now, please do use the microphone. I really have a problem hearing you, and it's my problem, not yours. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. yeah. You give me this example about this uh, this witty man and this help. You know, people are helping him indirectly by you know looking at things and making him feel yeah. good that they are not directly helping him. This is like a altruism, you know, some kind yeah. of a nice behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's going down. The mm -hmm. question is why? I mean, is it induced that some people have got like really conspiracy, has the conspiracy theory to kill the altruistic nature of people or this is a natural phenomena? And as like, you know, Jeffrey was saying that this is socioeconomic kind of entropy, that it's a natural tendency of a system to naturally go into this so that it can purge itself. This entropy can essentially purge itself at some point, you know, the part of the system again. Uh, I would argue that this is part of the growth of the group, so that there is less attention for individuals in the group. Uh, clearly, if you have a very small group of people, uh, it's relatively easy for everybody to get what they want out of it. Uh, but take the example of after a meeting like this with 10 people having to decide where you want to go and have dinner. It's going to be really difficult. And that has to do with the fact that the number of communications that is necessary to get everybody aligned is so numerous that it becomes more and more difficult to actually maintain that kind of long-term altruism that is a in certain societies. But there are other people at the Santa Fe Institute who do a lot more work on this than I ever have. And I think it'd be interesting for you to read some of the work of Sam Bowles and his team, for example. Jeffrey was referring to that earlier, about how this plays out in different cultures. I have a question Please. about uh, the kind of uh, equilibrium point, a fixed point for our society to live yeah. in. How, you, how, how can you prove or conjecture that that fixed point exists? I don't think you can. That was exactly what I was trying to say. <laughs> but, but, then, but then we are just trying to find a fixed point which we never exists, then... Well, we may want to construct one. That is why I was talking about ethics. Construct. Why I'm talking about looking, thinking much more about what kind of nature do we want? What kind of society do we want? We don't define that. That is one of the reasons it's so difficult to define sustainability, because we don't know what we want. And so that is another part of this debate that needs to be had, in my mind. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, I would like to present a token appreciation to you. Um, thank you very much. Just bringing me here is more than enough. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think this concludes our uh, this session. So I hope everyone has uh, has a nice lunch.